The effort to fight disease has existed among the human race for centuries, providing both hardship and motivation. The gasping breath of whooping cough, the iron lungs and braces designed for children paralyzed by polio, and the devastating birth defects caused by rubella. To most Americans, these infectious plagues represent obscure diseases of years past. Yet only a little more than a century ago, the childhood mortality rate before age 5 was 20%. In the era before the existence of preventative methods, infectious diseases such as measles, diphtheria, smallpox, and pertussis topped the list of childhood killers. Our struggle to erase these diseases, as much as it is tragic in its failures, is magnificent in its defeats. Defeats that can only be obtained through the innovation of science and the power of the human mind. One of the greatest triumphs that we have had in these fields has been the creation and development of vaccinations. The idea of immunization began as early as 200 BCE, when early forms of vaccinations using powdered smallpox scabs were being created in India and China, and mentions of the invention were found in Ayurvedic texts. Despite this significant innovation, the official creation is dated in the mid-18th century by British scientist Edward Anthony Jenner, who pioneered the smallpox vaccine by taking pus from a cowpox lesion on a milkmaid's hand, inoculating an eight-year-old boy, and later inoculating his arm again with smallpox to find that he was now immune to the disease. With knowledge of Jenner's discovery spreading across Europe, kings and presidents offered mass-scale vaccination campaigns in an effort to demonstrate their forward-looking stance toward science and their commitment to the health of their citizenry. By 1800, 100,000 people had been vaccinated in Europe, and in 1803, King Charles V sent an expedition from Spain to the Americas to introduce smallpox vaccination to its colonies. In 1885, Louis Pasteur developed what he called a rabies vaccine. Pasteur expanded the term beyond its Latin association with cows and cowpox to include all inoculating agents. His definition of vaccine as a suspension of live or inactivated microorganisms administered to induce immunity and prevent infectious disease is still referred to today. In Europe and North America during the 19th century, Smallpox vaccination was made obligatory under state laws. In the 20th century, vaccination became required for public school attendance. In the mid 20th century, an intense competition developed between rivals Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin over the race to a polio vaccine. Salk was the first to come up with his killed virus vaccine, but not without his critics who labeled Salk a quack and sellout for rushing to market his vaccine. The massive testing of the vaccine in clinical trials in the United States and Canada was unprecedented, and the results were dramatic. 1.3 million school children were inoculated in the 1954 Salk vaccine trials. But there was a problem with the original Salk vaccine. The vaccine actually induced 260 cases of polio, including 10 deaths, and before the mass immunization was finished, Albert Sabin's live virus oral vaccine became the one adopted internationally. The question of which polio vaccine was better, Jonas Salk's or Albert Sabin's, was raged for, for a couple decades in this country. Um, but the answer is clear. And the answer is it was Jonas Salk's vaccine. Because what Jonas Salk's vaccine could do is it could in induce protection, including long-lived protection, without having to pay the very rare price of polio. Because Sabin's vaccine, although it was an excellent vaccine and certainly protected against disease, every year in this country when we were using that vaccine, six to eight children would become paralyzed by it. And by using Salk's vaccine, we didn't have to pay that price. The anti-vaccination movement, which began in the 1830s, after an initial generation had been vaccinated and the incidence of smallpox had declined markedly in the United States and Europe, has continued to this day. In 1986, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act was spearheaded by parents troubled by a possible link between vaccination and neurological problems. 
Parents and watchdog groups have raised important questions about the possible link between a noticeable rise in autism and the preservative thimerosal, which was previously used in several major vaccinations. Recently, a series of scientific studies have demonstrated that there is no causal connection between thimerosal and autism. Nonetheless, in 1999, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration stopped licensing thimerosal-containing vaccines. The suggestion that vaccinating one's child might lead to developmental disorders has fostered unease among many parents. Increasingly, public reactions to vaccines are usually quite strong, ranging from awe to skepticism and outright hostility. In certain parts of the U.S., vaccination rates have dropped so low that occurrences of some children's diseases are approaching pre-vaccine levels for the first time ever, and the number of people who choose not to vaccinate their children continues to rise. In states where such opting out is allowed, 2.6% of parents did so last year, up from 1% in 1991, according to the Center for Disease Control. There is a concern about vaccines. Um, some people are choosing not to get them. What's the big deal? But it's not a theoretical problem anymore. We've had mumps outbreaks like we've never seen, you know, just in the last couple of years. We've had a measles epidemic in 2008 that was bigger than anything we've seen in more than a decade. We're having children die of bacterial meningitis from Hib. And I don't think it's going to end there. I mean, I think if we continue to see an erosion of vaccination rates in certain communities, I don't think it's going to end with what we've seen with mumps and measles and bacterial meningitis. I think there's every reason to believe polio could come back into this country it still exists in the world. It took more than 80 years after Jenner's discovery for scientists to develop new vaccines. Only in recent decades have vaccinations for diseases such as polio and malaria been created, and the efforts to foster vaccination for HIV continues to be a menacing and consuming issue to this day. Most attempts to develop the vaccine have ended in failure, and only recently the Gates Foundation launched an initiative aimed to develop effective HIV vaccination. Without adequate funding, vaccine shortages will persist, and lives throughout the world will remain at risk. Vaccine safety, research, and the strict maintenance of sterilization standards remains a concern. Even as these have improved greatly over time, the fact that vaccines are biological agents often makes them much more difficult than drugs to produce. Vaccines um, are not a big money maker for pharmaceutical companies because there's something that one takes once or a few times in one's lifetime, as distinct from you know, lipid lowering agents or diabetes drugs or neurological drugs which you take every day. Those are the big money makers. I mean, the entire worldwide vaccine market is probably in the, in the sort of eight to twelve billion dollar range. Whereas, you know, you can get a single lipid lowering agent which can sell for $13 billion total. So it's not, vaccines aren't a big market. And I think, you know, if, if you look at what drives research, it tends to be, you know, where the money is. And, uh, and uh, NIH certainly has been very good, the National Institutes of Health, about, about funding, uh, funding good research. But um, the, the research tends to be much greater on the drug side than the vaccine side. As the fight for cures continues and new epidemics arise every year, Vaccination is a constant area of innovation. I think, I think vaccine innovation since the days of Edward Jenner in the late 1700s have been largely trial and error. I mean, if you look at, at the, the, uh, the theory of vaccine, the tetanus vaccine, the whooping cough vaccine, um, the, the Jenner's smallpox vaccine, and then the more recent vaccines, measles, mumps, German measles, rubella, um, it's really just been trial and error, and, and using, using just a few ways of doing it. So for viruses, you can take the whole virus and kill it. That's what Jonas Salk did. Um, for the hepatitis B vaccine, you can just take part of the virus. That's how we make, make that, that vaccine, also the human papillomavirus vaccine. You can take a virus and weaken it, like the measles and mumps and rubella vaccines are also weakened live viruses, so is the, the, the rotavirus vaccines that are currently out. Um, the, so there's not really actually a sort of limited number of strategy actually for how to make vaccines. So in some ways the path to making vaccines has been fairly well worn. Now we're getting much better at it because we've had advances in things like protein chemistry, protein purification, recombinant DNA technology. So actually we make much purer, much safer vaccines than we did a hundred years ago. One can only hope that as scientific knowledge increases and individuals engender new information, the battle against disease will finally be won.